My name is Helen Desmond. Today is June 22, 1994. We are here six, who is a survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. I am doing this under the auspices of the Holocaust Documentation Center, Incorporated. The purpose of this interview is to add to the oral history of the Holocaust so that through this living memorial, future generations will know what happened. With this knowledge, we hope to prevent any such occurrence in the future. Good morning, Mr. Isaacs. Uh, would you please state your full name? Um, and, uh, no, no. Your I name. In German, I if, uh, no, just tell uh, us what your name is in English. Isidore Isaacs. Did you use a different name in Germany? Isidore Isaac was a Nazi S was with K on the end. We shall begin by talking about the uh, city, the town from which you came. But please tell me first, where were you born and what was your birth date? I'm born in, in Tilsit, T-I-L-S-I-T. Germany. And your birthday? September 20th, 1905. Uh, is this a large city, Tilsit? Only 40,000. And how large would you say the Jewish population was? Maybe 1,000. Out of 40,000? How did most of the people in your city earn their living? I was then a schoolboy and I had the stores, stores and doctors and lawyers and storekeepers and we had a rabbi. And the Jewish people were, how did they earn their living? What did they do mostly? They were mostly merchants. Merchants. Mm. Were there are professional Jewish people also? Yeah, they were lawyers and doctors. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about your own family. Uh, how many children were in your immediate family? We were six children. Could you tell me the names of your brothers and sisters starting from the oldest? Simon, 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 and then came, I came, Isidore, and then came, um, came as uh, Etta, Hannah, and the youngest was Hildegard, and Benno, I'm uh, the youngest uh, brother, Benno. Yes. And what were your parents' names? My father was Nissan. And your mother's name? Ida. How did your father earn his living? What did your father do for? He had a, a store. What kind of a store? So a general section, the small towns, uh, general merchandise. Did your mother work with him? No. Your mother? She had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Six children. <laughs> um, tell me about your schooling in during your childhood. Did yeah. you grow up in Tilsit? And, uh, yes. And tell me about your schooling. I went to a middle middle school. Was that a public school? No. Yes, it was. I would say a public school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A German, a German school. You went, was it a mixed school, Jewish and Gentile children? Yeah, we have, they don't remember any Jewish students. You, there were no Jewish students in that school? Must have been, yes. Yeah, very, not many. Uh, did you have any religious training? Yeah, we had uh, afternoon at uh, Jewish uh, religious uh, in the afternoon, a couple were, of times a week. Were your parents religious people? 
My father was not religious, no. My what? mother was a, a grandfather was a cantor, her father. Were there many synagogues in your city? I remember one synagogue. Um, Were you affiliated with that synagogue? Yeah, we were, we were, yeah. Th this was in Europe. You, you had to be, don't you have to be ta pay taxes from, from the federal taxes, you had to pay 10 percent for religious for the religion, for the synagogue, 10 percent from your income, yeah, this was the law. It was a German law? This was a German law, yeah. And so your family supported the synagogue through laws? Yeah, to the 10 percent from the income. Were there um, other, were there any organizations that you belonged to as a young person growing up? I don't remember any organizations, no. Jewish organizations? No, there was none. The environment was mostly Christian, the, the neighbors and everything. There were very few, few Jewish people, I recollect. You grew up... I now remember the, can, the rabbi, he died in uh, New York. He, tra he emigrated to the United yeah, States? Yeah, Dr. Reusel, yeah. Dr. Reusel? Reusel, Reusel. Reusel. Yeah, Reusel. After you finished your middle school yeah. studies, how old were you at that time? Then I was... Sixteen. Uh, and what did you do after yeah. that? Then I went to helping my father in, in the business. And was that your profession? You worked with your father? Yeah, yeah. You grew up uh, during the years of the First World War. My father was a German soldier in the war. He was enlisted or drafted? Yeah, he was enlisted, yeah. And he became a prisoner of war in, in Russia. He was from 1915 to 20. He was a prisoner in, in Tashkent in Asia. And during those years, did you were you the provider for the family? No, the, the provider was then my uncle. Only after the, my father died, then I was the, the provider. So your father returned to Germany in 1920. He returned 1920 from prison He was camp. released from the Russian prison yeah, camp. Yeah, uh, During those uh, First World War years, was there any anti-Semitism in Germany? Always. Always. Mm -hmm. uh, can you recall any specific incidents of anti-Semitism? Well, my <clears throat> and my father was uh, in the, on the bar and so on with friends, and then they suddenly start making anti-Semitic remarks. <clears throat> I was as a school friend in a, in a restaurant, and suddenly start throwing the bottles around, and, and he was such a f good boy, and, and uh, there were always uh, anti-Semitic uh, incidents. And this was directed against you because you were Jewish? Yes. Uh, they were very anti-Semitic, the population. Were you prevented from um, getting a job or from going further because yeah, you I were Jewish? I didn't look for a job, no. Uh, so you worked in your father's store during yeah, those yeah, yeah. after thirty from well we say from twenty till thirty one when my father died. You worked in the store. Yeah, and then I, be, I became the owner after my father's death. And you continued to work there. Yeah. During those years. Yeah. Um, at that time. Was there an increase in anti-Semitism in Germany? Not overt, but 
not not incidents now, not violent uh, outside incidents. Only that the people we left secluded. We will say we had didn't we had no not with the Christian population, no contact. Were did you live only in, a, in business? Did you live in a Jewish neighborhood? There was no very few Jews. In, in, uh, uh, but you you s tended to stick together in your social activities. There was an in occasions uh, to the holidays we went uh, in the synagogue to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and. Um, then we had contact with a nearby city, which was larger than ours, and there we had, uh, there we spent the holidays there. What city was that? This was Heidekrook. Heidekrook? Krook. Krook. Krook, yeah. This was a little bit larger city. And there were more Jewish there people? There were more Jews, yeah. So you would go there to be with yeah. Jewish people? Yeah. Were you married at this time during these years? No. Mm -hmm. No. Now, in those pre-war years, I'm talking about the Second World War now, before the Second World yeah. War, uh, what did you hear was happening throughout Germany? Were you aware of the, not, the rise of Nazism? Yes. <coughs> I was very aware of and afraid of, yes. You were afraid? Yeah, yeah, what was coming. What changed? Yeah, with my brother in law and the biggest, he lived in the Königsberg and he was married to my sister. And I said to him, it's going very much to the left. Now he said, you are wrong, it goes very much to the, to the right. What year was this, would you say? Nineteen thirty. That early. Yeah, thirty-two, thirty-three. Yeah. Thirty-three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What changes occurred in your town as Hitler started to gain power? We didn't stay there. We ran away. <coughs> when when did you leave? <coughs> this was the <coughs> March twenty-third. 1939, <coughs> we were friendly with, with a girl in the post office and she called me up and said, hey, Isaac, the Germans are coming in tomorrow, occupying. Well, you lived in Germany, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, but this was, later we moved to Memel, Memel Gebiet, this was, this was then to Lithuania. So you moved to Memel? Yeah, my father had a store in Memel Gebiet. Memel Gebiet yeah. in Lithuania. Yeah, yeah. And when did you move to Memel? This was 1920 about, yeah. Oh, you moved yeah, in yeah, 1920? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So your friend advised you in 1939. The post, uh, girl, from the post office, the girl called me. End of March '39, uh, that the uh, Germans tomorrow will be in uh, occupying the Memel Gebiet. <coughs> and then I called the next city in Lithuania, this was Schweixny. Schweixny? Schweixny, there lived a lot of Jewish people, it was a Jewish town. And I uh, ordered a taxi and a little, a little van and they should come and pick me up. Were you married at yeah, this point? Yeah, we were married. We had a little boy and my mother and my sister. When did you marry? We married in 1936. And what is your wife's name? Bertha. Bertha. And your son's name? Ralph. We called him Noni, yeah. After my father. So you you uh, ran away to Schwickney. 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 Yeah. 
and uh, that was in Lithuania, yeah. and you did that in March of 1939. March 20, 30, 39. <coughs> but then we, from Schweiz, we moved to Tauragen, Tauragai, Tauragen, in Lithuania. Also in Lithuania. Yeah, when we had did... already prepared an um, apartment, and we had some furniture already. We, had all, we were prepared already to run away. So you were very aware of the danger yeah, that was yes, coming. Yes, yes, We had already rented an apartment in Tauragen and, and shipped some furniture. And, and from Schwixny, we, we went with the car, with the, with the truck, we went to, to Tauragen. And when was that? This was um, 13, it was March 39. Oh, so you only stayed in Schwixny for a no, very short time? No, only for the night, for the day. Oh, I see. We moved right to you. I see. Yeah. All right. Now, in the few years <clears throat> before 1939, as Hitler was gaining power, did any members of your family leave Europe, leave Germany? No, but my, my, my sisters and brothers. They did leave Germany? Yeah. I managed to, as I said, to get them to Israel. You were able to get them to Israel? Yeah. And what years was this? <coughs> 33, 34, 35, and this, and 33 to 35. <coughs> In 1933, you were already aware that there was going to be a problem? Yes. Why did you not leave at that time also? We had a storm that was uh, to help them, the, my brothers and sisters to get out. And Were you making an attempt to get out yourself at that we point? We had visas to America. This came later. But you could not use them? We, we didn't get the... Uh, we were always from consul that told me come in six months, come in six months, come in six months, till it was too late. You were living in Lithuania <coughs> yeah, at this yeah. time. Mm. Were the Lithuanian people um, uh, friendly towards the German people, would you say? Were they sympathetic to the German people? They were anti-Jewish, very anti-Semitic. That's, that's the first. The church always preached uh, against uh, Jesus killers, always. <clears throat> when you sent your brothers and sisters to Israel yeah. with their families, yeah, did they you... They were mostly not married then. Oh, they were single? Mm, yeah. Did you have a problem getting them out of Germany at that time? Was it difficult for them to leave Germany? In 1933, 34? No, there was no difficulty, no. They could go there at that time still. Yeah. They could leave yeah. easily. Yeah. As long as you had the money yeah. to buy a yeah. ticket, yeah. they could yeah. leave. Yeah, they could leave. My oldest brother went illegal. illegal. How did over he? Over Turkey, over Romania. And it was on the Patria when the Patria exploded in Haifa. That was the name of his ship? Yeah, Patria. Yeah. So he was on that ship. He went I illegal to the oldest brother. Who when was away. that? When was that? This was 41. I oh, think. this was l much this later. Was, this was later. This was already very late, yeah. Oh, and yeah. he, he um, hid and ran and escaped through. Turkey through yeah, Europe. Yeah, Turkey, Romania, and, uh, and the, the ship was named Patria. And, um, but he he survived. He that survived, yeah. And, and he, he lived died in, in uh, died in Tel Aviv, yeah. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about uh, the early days of the occupation. This is recorded. Oh, talking. sure. Yeah. Yes, everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about the early days of the occupation by the Nazis. Uh, where were you living <clears throat> when the war broke out? You lived in Taurogen. Taurogen. And that and was... The, the, where the Russian then had occupied the Russian. We lived we then from 39 till 41. When we lived under the Russian. Okay. Um, then the war broke out. 
when June 22nd, 41. What happened between 1939 and 1941 when you were living under the Russians? Were you offered Russian citizenship at any time? Yes, yes, we had. Uh, we were forced to to take uh, Russian citizenship. You were forced to yeah, take yeah, Russian yeah, citizenship. Yeah. Uh, were any citizens deported from Lithuania to Russia during yes, those yes, years? Yes, 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 yes. I remember that. The capitalist was uh, called him. Uh, they were shipped uh, to Russia. Yeah, well, it was maybe their luck. Were you considered a capitalist because you owned a business? We were refugees that didn't know much about me. <laughs> I see. Maybe it would have been good if they had tripped us to Russia. Uh, what was your life like during those two years? Uh, was there uh, enough food to eat? Yeah, it was very good in two years. We lived very well here. Yeah. Did the Russians discriminate against the Jews? No. Were you able to continue work? I got um, a job in a, in a supermarket, a cashier. What happened to your business? Just everything left. In, in Germany? Yeah, yeah. In Lithuania? Yeah, house and everything. I had a, a farm on, on 35 hectares. 140 Morgen, uh, it's called in German. 140 no. acres? Acre, acres, acres, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you left it all behind? I left all, everything. All right, now in Tarragon, under the Russians, uh, were there schools? Did they allow schools to take, take no, place? My, my own little son went to the kindergarten under the Russians. They so didn't bother. No. And uh, no. how about religion? Could you go to a, a synagogue if you wanted to? Did the Russians allow that? Well, I don't remember in Tauhagen that we went to synagogue. Probably. Did. At that time, they didn't bother. No. Uh, were there any laws made against either the Jews or the general population um, that were restrictive, that you couldn't, that there were curfews or? Nothing. Nothing. You were able to live a? Free, very free. You could yeah. come and go anywhere yeah. you wanted? Yeah, they didn't bother anybody. Okay. Uh, then what happened? Uh, in 1941, yeah, the, the war broke out. What what was <coughs> the date of that? This was uh, June 22nd, 41. And uh, the bombarded the houses with, with from the air with, with aeroplane and uh, neighbor houses was burning and <coughs> and we had to and we were evacuated from the city. Where did you go? The Russian trucks evacuated us. My younger sister they had a boyfriend, and he carried our boy. And um, we ran after him in the truck. And my mother and the sister stayed a little bit behind us. And the, 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 the truck driver didn't wait a minute and drove away and my mother and sister stayed behind. And we never saw her to both anymore. But you and your wife managed and the boy. to, and your son yeah. managed to get on a truck. Yeah, yeah. And where did these, where did this truck take you? The truck to Shaolin. Shaolin? Yeah, it was the biggest city. And that was also <coughs> in Lithuania? Yeah. Now, let me go back a moment. You mentioned your mother and your sister were they living with you in in uh, Tolagan? No, yes, we lived together. Mm -hmm. This all the rest of your family though had gone to Israel. Yeah. Your other, except your oldest brother. You oh. said he left in 1941. Yeah. But the others in between. They were already in, in Israel. Were already yeah, in Israel. Yeah. 
And so your mother and your sister were left behind. Yes. And uh, when you went to uh, Shaolin, was this still under the Russian occupation? No, the Russian, they, they, they left you? They left, uh, the, the German, uh, the, the, they were in, in, in retreat. And, yeah. and, and what was Shaolin? What, what was it, a big city? Or? Yeah, it was a nice big city, yeah. And they just left you there? Yeah. And did you take anything with you? Didn't take only I had high, and, and on the roof, on the, the, the floor, I had exchanged $220 and three Israeli pounds, Palestine pounds, and a Nivea box. And the house was burning, and I had to go on the ladder up, and I went up. And that was your hiding place? Yeah, and I took them to the Nivea box with the two tw $220 and the three Palestine pounds. And and this, uh, we took this house. Did That's you take all. any clothing or? No clothes. When we were already in the ghetto, my mother still sent us to a Christian um, the bus driver, one package with clothes. So you did hear from your mother yeah. later on? Yeah, and she wrote, I shouldn't come. Come back. Shall so come back, all men are, are gone. And I shall only not come back. So yeah. now yeah. you are in Shaolin. Yeah. And where did you go? What did you do? We lived there with friends for a couple of months, and then they opened the ghettos in Shaolin, the Germans. When you arrived in Shaolin, were the Germans there yet? Yeah. Uh, what was your first contact with the Nazis? Was it in Shaolin? It was in the ghetto, yeah. Uh, what happened? Do you remember? How did they make the ghetto? I was working even to make the... They caught me and, uh, we, and we had to work to make the... to, to make uh, the wire for the, for the ghetto. You were doing that? Yeah. They enclosed the ghetto with barbed wire? Oh, and how, and how. And how? Yeah. How large was the ghetto? There were two ghettos, one uh, Taraku, where we were, and one Bazoon, the second ghetto. Tarakan? Taraku. Taraku. Taraku and Bazoon. Bazoon. Yeah. Two in the same city? Yeah. We were in, uh, in Taraku and how large was this ghetto, would you say? Well, maybe 5,000 people each, yeah. yeah. Each? Yeah. Uh, and who didn't come in, who, who didn't want to go in? So we have finished right away and, 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 and immediately. Did you go into the ghetto with your friends that you were staying with? Did they come into the ghetto with you? No, no, we were, we were alone. So it was you, your wife, and your son? And my, my yeah, my sister was in, 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 in Tauhoff and just left. Where did you live in the ghetto? In an apartment, in a room? In the ghetto? Yes. This was a work as, uh, Siedlung, um, where the workers' village, where the workers lived, and they, um, they, they took out the, the people and, and, and all the, the residents from that uh, from that here and made a ghetto there. And all the Jews had to go yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And what kind of living accommodations did you have? It was very poor. Uh, very poor. We had first uh, the one room and the kitchen for ourselves, and then they sent noch later more families then. Uh, what did you do in the ghetto? <coughs> first, I had to work on the aerodrome. They so were in a building an aerodrome. Like an airport? <coughs> yeah. yeah. 
Und sie opened the aerodrome and the elder rat made me, a, I should lead 300 people to the aerodrome. This was Young Kipper or Young Kipper Eve. They yeah. always choose such dates. What year? I was supposed to bring 300 people to the aerodrome. And when it came the morning, they should come, nobody, nobody came reported to the for work. And I alone was wandering to the Germans, was deserted the city, and reported that they were unable to get the 300 people together. And on the road, on the way, they met already in the car, they came into the ghetto, two SS people, and they took me in, in the car, and they said if I wouldn't have come, they would have shot me right away. And they came with trucks and they forced all the all the people in the trucks and brought them brought them to the to the aerodrome. Was this just men that they took? It was first well, it was only men, yes. About three hundred. Let's go on with that. What happened when you got to the aerodrome? There was a walk, uh, the cement carrying cement on, on, on rocks on, on, on. Did you go every day and come back to the ghetto at yeah, night? Yeah, that's right. In the evening we came back. Did they take you by truck to this aerodrome? No, we had to walk. How far was it? It was maybe eight miles, ten miles. So every day in the morning you walked? Yeah. And you worked the full yeah, day? Yeah, for 10 hours. And then you walked back again at yeah, night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back uh, a little bit because we'll yeah. talk more about that. Uh, when the Nazis first came yeah. into Lithuania and into uh, Shaolin and Torogan, uh, how did the non-Jewish population respond to the acts against the Jews? I didn't get that. When the Nazis first occupied, yeah. how did the non-Jewish population react? 90% were anti-Semitic. Did they support the Nazis? Yes, I did. Sure. With full heart. How? What did they do? So, they helped them later to to kill the Jews, uh, they came in the ghetto and, and made uh, the registrations and gave yellow cards and there was continuously, and this were all the Lithuanians who did it, the dirty work. Did the national government, did the Lithuanian government make any attempt to protect the Jews? The, the Lithuanian government wasn't Later I met in Stutthof and I was in concentration camp. There were the whole government, the Lithuanian government were also in the, they sent to the, to the concentration camp also. So they oh, yeah, could that, not help then? No, no. Uh, all right, so let's go back into the ghetto. Uh, you were working in the yeah, ghetto yeah. in this, uh, making this aerodrome. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the living conditions in the ghetto. You said that you had a very small uh, a apartment. Yeah. What about food? It was very, at times, generally the Lithuanian Jews, some had connection with the Lithuanian and and they always managed something wood for heating and sometimes to bring in fish, carps, and, and, and so this was in the beginning. But later got worse and worse. There were times when, when they gave for the children 50 grams of bread, one, one slice of bread. A day? Yeah. Was this each yeah, day? Yeah, very, very, very poor. And how about heat? How did you stay warm in the winter time? Yeah, I said um, we had to use wood. I said uh, the Ältestenrat, is, um, called, they called it. Uh, Was that the Judenrat? Judenrat, yes. Yeah. We'll talk about they that. They had money and they gave rings. And, 
the, um, they managed somehow and uh, something to bring in wood or something. Did the um, Gentile people, the non-Jewish people, help the Jews with this? Did they help provide wood or food? Only for, only for... Money. Money for the jewelry and something like that. Mm -hmm. Did you have electricity in the ghetto? Electricity? Electricity? No. Yeah. No. How did you have light? What did you use for light? Yes, we had um, kerosene lamps, something like that, yeah. Were you able to get the kerosene? Okay, I don't remember so well. Okay. Yeah. How about sanitation, washing facilities and bathroom facilities? Bathroom that were outside, out, outdoors. This was common in at that time? Yeah, yeah. How about um, health care, if you were ill? We had uh, the, Jewish, uh, the Jewish doctors, uh, we had uh, doctors and dentists. There were? Yeah. Was there a hospital? Yeah, there was a hospital, yeah. Were you ever ill during those years? Did you ever need to use a doctor or medical help? Um, yeah. Yes, my wife used to quite frequently. Were there medicines available? I don't think so, no. Mm -hmm. Were you able to get in and out of the ghetto? No. It was with barbed wire, you said? With barbed wire. You could only have uh, friends in the Jewish police. They were able to get out. Uh, Jewish. <coughs> we had one friend who was a Jewish policeman, and he brought the clothes from my mother. How did from he my get mother in. How did he get that package that you mentioned previously? How did your friend get that package? The, <coughs> the bus driver delivered to a friend who worked in the in the who worked in the city, and he brought us to her, and the policeman, the Jewish policeman, went to her and, and got it, brought it in. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the Judenrat and the Jewish police. Yeah. Uh, what did the Judenrat do in the ghetto? What was their function? They had with the Germans to keep contact and uh, had to do what the Germans uh, ordered them to do. They came and they wanted uh, so many people out. They had to, they had to do what the Germans was, was telling them. Do you feel that the Judenrat helped the people? I don't think so. Do you remember the names of any of the leaders of your Judenrat? I remember one Heller. Heller? <coughs> was, he, was he the head of the Judenrat or was no, he just a member? Remember. Just a member. <coughs> and the people, he was already a little bit um, confused. Uh, and then the people went to him and said, We have no bread. We have, we have no bread. And then he answered, When man nicht had bread, back man a Halle. If you had bread, you would if bake you a challah. If you don't have bread, bake a, bake a challah. If you don't have bread, bake a challah. Yeah, this was the answer from the cellar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had always food for themselves. They did? Yeah. They were rewarded for being on the Judenrat? Yeah. They played a game for the German games. They had to. I know you <coughs> mentioned the Jewish police. Uh, was there more than one Jewish organization, police organization? There was no organization, no. The police, the Jewish there, police? There was Jewish police, yeah. They were under the, under the uh, Germans. They were under the Germans? No, I think they were under the Altestenrat. You call it an Altestenrat yeah, rather uh, than a Judenrat? Yeah, yeah okay. Judenrat. 
Um, let me go back and ask you about the, uh, the ghetto, the guarding of the ghetto. Who were the guards at the, the ghetto gates? Was it the Jewish police or the Germans or whom? I think so. I, I don't remember correctly. Maybe my wife remembers. I don't. Were there? So, what did the Jewish police do? What did? What was their job? To keep order. They all went to the police. Then they got doubled, doubled food. The the policemen, the people who served as police, got extra food. And you mentioned you had a friend who was a policeman. Yeah. Were they um, kinder to the Jews than the Germans were? Some were very rough. Was there a jail in the ghetto? A jail? No, it was no jail. But outside the ghetto was a, was a jail, a Lithuanian jail. Did the Jewish police ever arrest any Jewish people and send them to jail? I don't recollect that. Uh, did the Germans come into the ghetto to oh, keep yeah. order? Oh, yes. There was one, his name was Schneider, and he was beating up people. He came always to, to the ghetto. Can you um, tell me if there were any Jewish or non-Jewish organizations from outside of the ghetto that offered help? You're saying no. Not to my knowledge, no. Can you describe some of the activities that went on in the ghetto? Were there religious activities in the ghetto? Did you observe holidays and, and hold services? Okay, I don't think so. Were there educational activities in the ghetto? No. No school? No. How about, uh, were there any cultural activities? Newspapers or there was a newspaper Heintegenayas, as I recollect, a Jewish newspaper. Was that a legal paper or illegal? I don't know where it came from. I don't remember that. Did you have radios? Radios was forbidden. It, death penalty. Death penalty. Yeah. Did anybody have one? Did you know? Yeah, no. I remember I had, uh, I was listening to the BBC in London. Where did you, where did you go to listen to this? Was it in somebody's home? It was in somebody's home, yeah, I listened to the BBC. Did you do this on a regular basis? No. But this was a forbidden activity. Oh, until, until. Mm -hmm. Were there any Christians in the ghetto? There was, a <clears throat> there was one Christian, a woman who was married to a Jew. And she was the only one she that you were from, yeah, they aware was from of? Our, our, from our place, from Heidekook. Her father had a, was a redacteur from them. Memla Dampfboot was the name, this was her father. He her father? The, the newspaper, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she married in the shoe, and she came with the shoe in the ghetto. And she was the only one that yeah, you're aware yes, of? Yes, I remember, yeah. Did you know of any resistance or underground organizations in the ghetto? No. No resistance groups? Not, not, not. Not as far as I'm concerned, no. Were you aware of any individual acts of resistance or defiance? Did anyone try to escape from the ghetto? Not as I know of. 
Did you witness any um, acts by the Nazis uh, or the Jewish police of cruelty or punishment? We, we know that uh, in the evening we had always shooting from the jail outside and they shot people who were carrying bread or something in the ghetto with a court uh, and they, they caught up with them and they shot them in the, in, the, in the jail we had in the evening always shooting in the, You could hear this? Yeah, we could hear this. It was but nearby you... outside, the, outside the ghetto. All right, yeah. so you told me... A lot of uh, disappeared from young people there. <clears throat> but um, some of the eldest in Rat went then to the jail or the Germans and gave them a... Bribe? Bribe, jewelry or so, and that they let them out. And they tried, they tried to, to, so the to save what they, what they could. They did try to save. They tried, they tried. Uh, how did you, uh, you mentioned that you worked on the aerodrome. But not all the time. Okay, what else yeah. did you do? Later we uh, went to the bassoon, to the second ghetto, and there was, I had to manage the, the washing, the washing of the... What kind of washing? Clothing? The, no, linen and, uh, and, and for the bats and, and shirts and so. There was a laundry? Laundry, yeah. And you managed? We had no soap. <laughs> whose laundry was this that you were managing? Who, whose laundry? From the people from, from the, the ghetto? ghetto people, yeah. Okay, now you mentioned this, the first ghetto and the second ghetto. I'm going to ask you to say them again slowly. I'm going to try to spell them or ask you yeah. to spell Traku. them. T-R-A-K-U. That was the first ghetto. Yeah, that's where we lived. And then from the first ghetto, you went, did you move to the second ghetto or? I had to walk to the second ghetto every day. How far was that? Half an hour. And what was the second ghetto again? Bas, Basun. Would, could you spell that? B, A, C, U, N. Soon, something like that. Something okay, like that. so that's the second ghetto. Yeah. And how long did you work in the laundry there? I walked till till we were to, till we were evacuated till forty four. Okay, um, so you entered the ghetto forty one. Do you remember the date by this any chance? It was in August forty one. And you stayed until. Till we were evacuated till July 44. <clears throat> July 44. Now tell me, uh, how long was your family able to remain together in the ghetto? Were you together with your wife and your son the whole time? Uh, there was an action on November 5th, 43, when they took our son, all the children from the ghetto, who they can catch. Can you describe what happened that day? It was, it was a horrible day. It was, it was the worst day of our lives. Oh. My little boy, before, and nobody knew from the actions, he said to me, Daddy, dig me a hole in the garden that I can hide. He, he never knew that the action was coming. If you don't, you will cry when I am no more, he said. Your son had yeah, a feeling? Little, yeah, he said to me. How old was he? He was six years old. Did you do this? Did no. You? No, can I keep him in a, in a hole? And, and, uh, that's what he said. That's what before, the, before this happened. Well, nobody knew it would happen. But the children, they, they knew already. The children had a yeah, feeling. A feeling, yeah. That's what will happen to them. How did they take your child? <clears throat> it was early in the morning. There came a battalion of Ukrainian in a German uniform. 
Ukrainian. Ja, und sehr, ich went von Haus zu Haus und, und grabte all die Kinder in Trucks und brachte ihm Kerze und Möwe, all die elderly people some too, but mostly children. Und about, maybe 500 children. Und 200, over 100 were saved, but the people were hiding them. They were managed to hide them. Yeah, to hide them. Before the soldiers came. Or, or, or when they were in already, they hide, were hiding them in the attics or on the burlap bags or somehow. What did they tell you when they took the children? Did they tell you where they were taking them? Nothing, nothing, nothing. They were put in trains later. We heard that they were put in trains. And I didn't think they, were, they went far. Mm -hmm. There was one from the, from the, one hero I want to mention from the Judenrat. His name was Katz. Katz? Yeah. What did and Mr. Katz And he asked Katz the Germans, where are the children going? And they answered to him, you want to know, come with them. And he went. He did go. He did go with them. Was a young man, was a fantastic person, a young man. And did he have a child in that group also? No, no. He was not married to my knowledge. Yeah. Did anybody else try to stop the Germans at no, that point? No, not to my knowledge, no. Were there ever any other actions? Oh, there was continuously the registering on the, we had to go to yellow, getting a yellow card. And we, and we went, <clears throat> and we had to tell them the occupation. And my wife said she's a dressmaker. And I said I'm a dental, dental. Um, dental assistant? Okay, yeah. I said, everybody is a dressmaker and everybody is a dental. And Betty let us, let us do. And the people, there were women who had children and no husband. The husbands were already killed. And they packed them right away and trucks out. Was this after yeah. that uh, November 5th action or before? This was before. Also. Yeah. Uh, what did the yellow card mean? That you have a right to, to stay in the, in the ghetto. So if you had a yellow card, yeah. you were protected? For the day, yeah. yeah. It the really day. didn't mean very ah, much? Nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> Did you have to wear a yellow star or a star? All the time we had a yellow, yellow star. On your arm? Yeah, your, yeah, yeah. Was it a yellow star yeah, that you yeah, wore? Yeah, yeah. And make mm -hmm. a coat and everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would happen if you would not wear that star? Do you, if you didn't wear it, what would happen? Uh, would be arrested, and what happened then we could imagine. Now, you mentioned that you were listening to the BBC broadcasts. Yeah. Uh, you, what did you hear about what was happening in Europe? Were you aware of what was going on? I heard um, mostly Thomas Mann, he was talking and... Through whom? Thomas Mann. He's a German writer, was in London then. Oh, Thomas Mann. Thomas Mann, yeah. And I remember him saying, Deutsches Volk, ich warne dich. What does that mean? I warn you, the German people, I warn you. Did you believe these stories that you were hearing? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. we did. Were there any suicide attempts in the ghetto that you were aware of? The what? Suicide attempts. Did people take their lives? Yes, and uh, there were some. There yeah, were some. Yeah. What is the most powerful memory that you have of your ghetto experience? This was the worst day when they took the children. When they took the yeah. children. Did you ever hear later what happened to that train? 
that's a yeah, that I didn't bring them far. And they're probably so we may cousin may, who wrote a letter. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. about that. Uh, we brought him in a camp. And what happened, really, I don't know. Sorry. And I never want to mention that we are <coughs> and that children saved. What that happened day. to those children, those hundred yeah. children? Later, 44, when the Russian were near, they transported us in trains to Stotthof, the concentration camp. And the women who had children, they, they took right away and killed them right away. This was the end from the hundred. Those hundred. Yeah. They were saved for, for a year a or year. so. A year. Now, yeah. during that year yeah. that they were saved, yeah. while you were still living in the ghetto, they were there illegally, right? Or, you know, they weren't supposed to. They had no right for bread for nothing. So they yeah. were always hidden, those hundred children? Mm -hmm. Or did they go about freely also? Did they keep them hidden in the houses? I think so, yeah. yeah. Did you have a curfew yeah, right. in the ghetto? A curfew? Did yeah. you have to, were you allowed to yeah. walk around? No, there was a curfew till the time I don't remember anymore. Uh, well, let's talk now about the deportation from yeah, the ghetto yeah. in, in 1944. Yeah, it was in July 44. Do you know what date that was in July? It was July, maybe the 12th about, yeah. Was the liquidation done all at one time, or was it done in stages? I think in one time. One time. Yeah. Everybody left yeah, at the same yeah, time. Yeah. Tell me about the day that you left the ghetto. What happened? How did you hear that you had to leave? I really don't remember that. Who in your family left with you? Yeah. Who left with you? Your I wife? No, my wife. Only my wife. Did you take any personal possessions with you? Yeah. What did you take uh, with you? I had clothes and. Uh, no, so otherwise, not, I don't think much, very little. Did you try? No, what we had on our, on ourself. Did you try to hide anything? <clears throat> My wife had to, still to find the two twenty dollars, ten dollars left, and she was sitting at it in in a shoe in in the heel of her yeah, shoe. Yeah, yeah. Well, and she did hide that. Yeah, and this. This is this a whole story with the $10. Really? Yeah. All right, well. I took her shoes away in, in Stutthof. In Stutthof, so she yeah. lost the $10. Yeah. And another girl, she saw later wearing the shoes. <coughs> and she said, and they didn't fit her, the other girl, and they were good shoes. And, uh, and she was asking, she'll give her, the, she'll change the shoes, and I'll give her the shoes. And she didn't want to. Um, but she didn't fit her well, and later she, she gave, gave her back to... She, back your to, wife got back her shoes? Yeah. Was the money still there? Yeah, they didn't, didn't know. Uh, they didn't know? No, no. Well, that's your wife, part of your wife's story, right? Yeah, that's okay. the ten dollars what she did with that. <laughs> All right, well, let's go back to the day that you left the ghetto. Where were you gathered for the deportation? Do you remember that? Where did they take you? I think we were, we were brought to the trains to the, and then, and then, and, and trucks, and, and To the train station? Yeah, yeah, to the, to the, to the station. How long were you there at the station, waiting? I don't remember how long it was. Was it a long time or a short time? Maybe some hours. Some hours. Yeah. 
-hmm. Can you describe what happened at the train station? Can you tell us what it was like to be there? I only remember when we arrived in Stotthof. All right. What about the trip to Stutthof? How did you travel? What kind of train was it? It was box cars, uh, cattle cars. How long did that trip take? I really don't remember. That. What were the conditions on the box car? Was there any food? I think we had some food, I think. How about sanitary conditions? There was pills or something like that, yeah. Were there any escape attempts at that time? No, impossible. What was the um, general condition of the people during that transport, would you say? No, no. I don't think so was too bad. Did you know where you were going? No. They did not tell no, you where you no, were going? No. So while you were in the ghetto, you worked in two places. You worked in the aerodrome yeah. and in the laundry. Yeah. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, the train took you to Stutthof. Yeah. Can, how many camps were you in? Huh? How many camps were you in? Camp? Yeah, how many? You were in Stutthof. Yeah. And any other so camp? Yeah, the right way separated from my wife immediately. Okay. Were you in any other camp? Later I went to Dachau, but I hardly. <coughs> I was. I was. Uh, transport was supposed to be. I was only three weeks in Stotthof. So was a. There was a selection for workers, 500 workers for labor camps. And, and we had to jump, to jump through a window that was that high, and I couldn't make it. And maybe 30 other people, one man was blind. You have to sit down, sir. <laughs> and, and I couldn't make it, and they, they took us apart, about 30 people who couldn't jump through the window. This was in Stutthof? Yeah, in Stutthof, for the transport, for the labor camp. And they wanted to, to get out of Stutthof. This was a murderer. And I, ma I made a friend with a Danish doctor, Anderson. Maybe he was 20. He was an inmate, inmate, too. Was but he Jewish? No, Christian. He was from Norway, from, from all over the world, Christian, from the intelligence, from the, yeah. And I was friendly with um, Dr. Anderson. And I said to him, Dr. Anderson, for God's sake, help me that I come out from here. And he worked in the camp, in the office where they made a list for transport. They had more freedom. They were better treated than, than we. There was a difference in the way the Germans treated oh, the sure, Jews sure, and non-Jews. Sure, sure, sure. Doctor helped me. Why should you go? He said, working for the for the German victory, stay here. I took doctor I told Dr. Finkelstein von Kovno also he should stay here. I said, No, Doctor for help for God's heaven's sake help me to get out and he took my number. You had a number? Yeah, and went to the office and put my my number to the next transport. And when the day came, they called my number, and I was siding between the big, big guys. And, um, and so with the rubber, 
We got noch the sand off. They uh, hit you? Not me, I was hiding between the, oh. the tall guys. <laughs> and we went in the uh, in train store. Dachau. To Dachau. All right, let's go back. Uh, yeah. th that's how you got out of Stuttgart. Yeah. But let's talk. I really was stuck there. Let's talk a, a little bit about what happened when you arrived. You described uh, when you first came to Stutthof, was it day or night when you arrived? Did you arrive in the daytime or in the nighttime? Do you remember? It was daytime, I think. Mm -hmm. What did you see when you came? Did you see or smell or hear anything? No. Who met you? Who was there? when you came off of the train? It was SS, uh, yeah, it was. Did they tell was you? It horrible arrival there. Yeah. Tell me about that. What do you remember about mm -hmm. that? We saw the death in our eyes. It was strangers. You said that they separated you right away. Right away, yeah. What happened? How did they do that? Women left and men right, and, and we were right away separated. What happened to any of your belongings? Did you have anything? Did they <coughs> let you keep anything? I had the belongings, the best clothes, my best coat, and the papers, the birth certificates, and everything. When you had to, to undress and go to an enclosing. Enclosing? Enclosing. What does that mean? The, the disinfection. Oh. And we got the other clothes. I got the shirt with slice right away from the, from the disinfection. From the disinfection, you got an uh, infected shirt. Yeah, with mm -hmm. lice already. And they left all the papers and everything. And you had to leave the everything clothes behind. And everything. And they gave me the... Uh, not nice clothes. And I shaved, uh, shaved uh, the pub, public places and... Um, uh, shaved your head, yeah, shaved all the, the pub, hair, public, the pubic the hair. The public places too, mm -hmm. yeah. Did they give you a number there? Did you have a tattoo? Did they put a number on your arm? Yeah, I don't remember that. No? No. Um, did you see your wife? at all at that time? I think to the wire, we were separated by wires. And once she, somebody told her will be, that I will be at the wire. And then we met once and I told her when we should come together again, we will go to, uh, to Palestine, to Israel, as I told her. You, we will meet there. Yeah. You will meet in yeah, Israel yeah. after liberation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you see her again after that? Did you ever see her again no during more. the war? Or during those? No, only after, after the war. After the yeah. war. Uh, tell me about the living conditions in Stutthof. Did you live in a building? What kind of a building was it that you lived in? Was it a barracks or? A barracks, yeah. The food, the first day I threw out uh, right in the garbage and, and the other fellow I saw grabbed it right away and ate it. Did you eat it the second day? The <laughs> second day, I didn't throw it away anymore. <laughs> what did they give you to eat? <laughs> Terrible cabbage, un uncooked, uh, like raw. Uh, horrible. What were the uh, sleeping conditions like in the barracks? It was straw, straw on the, on, on the watch, straw on, on the floor. Yeah. Everybody slept on the floor? This was uh, higher up to bunks. Yeah, bunks, yeah. How many high were they? I think three, three, three parts, yeah. How many people slept in one section?
More than one person? Maybe two. Mm -hmm. Hmm. How about uh, toilet facilities? Pardon? Toilet facilities. God, this was horrible. I thought I was falling in all the time. It was only such a piece of wood, bread, a round one, and I had to sit on, and every time I thought I'd fall, I'd fall in, and it was horrible, the conditions of the toilets. Could you use the toilet facilities any time you wanted to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about washing, to wash yourself? Were there showers or? I think there were showers, yeah. I was only three weeks there mm -hmm. in Stratov. And the clothing, did you have more than one change of clothing? Only one, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a shirt, I washed it, and I was hanging it up for drying, and it disappeared right away. And what did you cover yourself with? The undershirt, I went, uh, all the years I was freezing to that, uh, I didn't have an undershirt, uh, yeah. Um, well, you were there in Stutthof in the summertime, is that right? Yeah, okay. August. Tell me about a daily routine in your life at camp. Was there a roll call in the morning? Well, every morning, when they were hitting the elderly people who urinate or, or, or moved or, or couldn't stand for We were woke up in the night, maybe three o'clock they woke us up, and then we had to stand up and we were counted. By, we had to wait till eight o'clock till the, till the SS man came counting us. And in the meantime, people you're a night or elderly people couldn't stand on. Uh, I remember one who had over the head, an old man, and was right away blood on, on his head with the rubber, rubber band. Rubber, uh, uh, rubber. What happened if they rubber fell? Horrible, horrible, terrible. And then we went back, then we got coffee in one um, pot for two. We had to two for, for one part. Had to you make had to coffee. share. You had to share one 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 shizzle. Um, oh, that was horrible, down Stutthof. Did you do oh. any work while you were in Stutthof? No. So you managed to make friends with this doctor. Yeah, yeah. Anderson. Yeah, doc, Danish Danish doctor. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the fact that there were uh, non-Jewish prisoners. Yes, yes. There was a whole uh, uh, Lithuanian government, there were Norway's, Norwegian, and Swedish, and from all, from all countries. Uh, How did they tell the difference uh, between the Jews and the non-Jews? Uh, did you wear... We had wear numbers, and we had no numbers. And, uh, were there uh, uh, badges or anything that you had to wear, different colors? Yeah, the badges on the, on the shirt. So the Jewish people wore one kind, yeah. and the other prisoners yeah. wore a different kind? Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned there was a difference in treatment. What was the difference in the treatment between the Jews and the non-Jews? I, I don't know what the food they had. They probably got better food also, mm -hmm. I so, suppose so. And so you left after three weeks. Yeah. And you went to Dachau. Yeah. In Dachau, I was a couple of nights only, and then uh, I was went to a labor camp. Which labor Lager camp? Lager 10. Lager 10? 10. In Uting am Amersee. Could you spell that for me? U-T-I-N-G. Mm -hmm. um, um, Amersee, on the lake. Um, oh. Amersee. A-M-M-E-R. S E E um, um, as a. And this was uh, near Dachau? Yeah, this belonged to the belonged to be a part of Dachau. Ten camps there open ten labor camps around labor camp one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, and you were in the last uh, one. Last, uh, and this was the best one. Was it a new camp that had been established? Yeah. Or yeah. what was the purpose? of that camp. Also, I want to build the aerodrome, always carrying cement from the wagons. 
some people were standing on, on, on top of the wagon on to a 100 pound <laughs> cement sack on me. And I fell with the cement oh, you, sack you in the dirt. You have to sit there. In the dirt. <laughs> it was so heavy for you. <laughs> and what happened? Uh, no shoes. The shoes were with, with the cement bags and, and wire. And the shoes were already gone. Oh, so you made up shoes from, out of the from, bags from the from cement. the cement bags and with wire. You around. wrapped it around with your feet. With wire, yeah. Now, when did you get to this Lager 10? This was in, in August 44. August of 44. Yeah. And was uh, Dachau far from Stutthof? Was it a long distance away? No, it wasn't far. How did you get from Stutthof to Dachau and then to Lager 10? By train or truck? I think by truck. I don't remember exactly anymore. Mm -hmm. What were the conditions like in Lager 10? This was one of the best camps. They really died only maybe 50, 50 people and, and they are buried there. This was, was the, the commandant was a German elderly shoemaker a shoemaker, and he came from time to time, looking over and went back. He didn't bother much. Do you remember his name? No. Okay. Uh, but he, he didn't uh, do no harm to us. What were, yeah. what were the conditions in this camp? Like, was there barbed wire surrounding this camp? Yeah, 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 sure. And who were the guards there? There were all, all Jews, I think. No, the guards. The guards, were they Germans? Yeah, they were Germans, yeah. German yeah, guards. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And in this camp, there were only Jewish prisoners? Yeah, they were Jewish. Did you do anything else besides build this airport, Aerodome? No, nothing else. That no. was the function that's of what, that camp? That's, yeah, that's what the function, the main function, yeah. How about the conditions in Lager 10? Uh, was the food different, better, or worse from Stutthof? Oh, yeah, well, much better. Better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was we there got soup on, on every day. In the evening, we got a hot, uh, hot soup and, and bread, hot soup and bread once a day. Well, lunchtime, also soup, I think. You had more food. Yeah, it was, then. was better. Yeah, How this belonged to uh, to the German this is organization who we were building all the aerodromes and all the, the, the. Was it a civilian organization? Yeah, this was a civilian organization. Yeah. Were you under? Um, who were your bosses? Were they civilian people or were they soldiers when you were working? Did you work for civilian people? Uh, civilian, yeah. They were mostly our, our people. How did they treat you, the civilian German people? They weren't the civilian German. I don't remember. Oh, wait, we just oh. dropped this. Let's put it back on again. Well, let me help you. All right. <clears throat> Did you or the other prisoners do anything special to help each other in, in during this time? There was one guy that we knew before, uh, a good friend, beloved, was his name, and he worked in the kitchen of Owen. I don't know. He had some some extra food. He gave me once a bag with farina. And then in the night I got up and cooked myself a little bit when the farina was hiding it on the May. And that's, that's all I remember he gave mm -hmm. me. Uh, were you ever ill or injured while you were working? No. Was there a hospital or medical facilities in the camp? So called. So called, okay. Without any value. Uh,
can you describe um, any single event that was the most difficult of all your experiences in the camp? The, the was the evacuation. Now in the camp, I, I got, in Lager 10, I got then diarrhea already. It was very bad. This is the beginning from the end, the diary. Did they help you medically? Did they give you any medicine no, for it? No, nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. And was this um, affecting your health? Did you become weaker at this point? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Did you ever experience complete despair when you just felt like giving up? No. Do you think there was any single factor that helped you to survive? No. All right, now tell me, um, this camp, uh, Lager 10, yeah. was located near Dachau, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you witness any forms of punishment in that camp? No. I know only one Polish youth hanged himself on a tree, as I remember. It was a suicide? Yeah. One. A Jewish boy? Yeah, mm -hmm. a Polish, Polish Jewish boy. Did you ever know of an instance where a whole group of prisoners was held responsible and punished for the act of a single person? No. Did you know of any attempts to escape from the lager? No. Were there any children in the camp? No. Were there any women in the camp? No. Was there ever a visitation by an outside organization to the camp? No. We got once, we got a package from Red Cross one, once. Did the Germans allow you yeah, to have yeah. that? There was a sugar in, uh, I think sardines a package, and from the sugar I ate every night uh, three, four pieces, and this kept me, kept me going. There were a few things, and, and everybody. Share, did you share this package? No, everybody. Everybody got Everybody it. got the a, a Red Cross package. This was once in that in that camp, Dachau, from Dachau, yeah. From when you were still in Dachau. Yeah. No, when we were already in in, in Lager Ten. Was there ever any attempt while you were in the camp to observe? educational or religious practices? None whatsoever. None? No. Was there... I know some, some very religious people there were on, on Passover, they didn't eat bread. They gave up their bread ration? Yeah, yeah. they ate potatoes, they changed it in potatoes, and I know a few they, they didn't, didn't eat. They, they knew when Passover was coming and yeah. holidays? I think this was in, in, the, in the ghetto and in, or then in, in the camp, I don't remember. But there were some religious people who didn't eat bread on, on Passover. Did they ever hold services, do you remember? No, no. Were there ever any acts of sabotage? Not that I know of. Now, tell me about the function of the following people, and I may not be pronouncing it correctly, so um, how about a capo? Did you have a capos in your Yeah, camp? yeah. What did they do? We had a capo in, 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 in that Lager 10. He, I knew him from the ghetto. He was a Polish Jew. He was okay. He didn't harm nobody. But in, in, in Stutthof, there was one Jewish, Max was his name. He was, I got once from him, we went in the woods and there were potatoes lying around and I took a couple of potatoes and he hit me with, 
with a foot here in the back that I had had pain for for a week and the he thinks they killed him after the liberation. Who killed him? Max was his name, that's why I saw tall tall fellow. Jewish man. Yeah. And what happened to him after liberation? I think they caught up with him and they beat him up badly or they killed him, I'm not sure. Yeah. How about uh, a block a block L tester? Hmm? Block L tester? Orchester? Block L tester. Yeah, there was one. It was from the ghetto too. It was a good good fellow Lithuanian. And my barack was was lit mostly workers from 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 Schauen. And they kept clean and, and they kept order. And they were all young young fellows and, and they, they they were uh, so the the um, am I pronouncing it right, Block L Tester? Yeah. Were they Jewish also? Yeah. And they kept order also. I kept order and clean on and was that a good thing, do yeah. you think? Yes. Were there any Sonder commandos at your camp? No. No. Were you able to get any news from the outside no. world? No. None whatsoever. Did you ever think that the camp might be bombed? Were you concerned about that? Yeah, we had, we, we, there was always luft alarm, alarm from the winter. And the day came, the nights we heard in the barracks, the English uh, air, um, Airplane. airplanes in the night were the English, and, and then the day were the Americans. Happened and then we had to run in the woods, and we didn't have to hide it, and that we don't get hit. And we heard and they were bombing the cities. Uh, nearby Augsburg was a big uh, industrial German city, and they were bombing the, the Americans all. Were you worried and that we, your camp would be hit? We were happy when they came. Then we didn't have to walk. We so didn't they, have to run away. they let you hide in the woods? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did anybody try to escape at that time? Not that I know of. Mm -hmm. Can I interrupt a moment? Oh, is there a problem? Yeah, I wonder. Well, <laughs> it's not good, no? It's not a good time. No. Can we wait just a few minutes? Okay. All right. Uh, what were the first signs for you that the war was coming to an end? This was 44, and we saw in the Germans already that the things are not kosher. This was 44. How did you suspect this? Yeah, we saw it in the faces. And then they, they evacuated our camp and they brought us to, back to Dachau. When did this happen? This was in August. This, this was in, in, in April, end of April 45. They took you back to Dachau, uh, yeah. Okay. And from there, they took us on a march, nine days. It was called the Death March. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, for nine days, they were to, to the mountains in Tirol. All right. Well, let's talk about that. Would you like to stop for a minute? Is that? Are you yeah. uncomfortable now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can we stop the tape for just a moment, please? Just let's wait just a minute.
My name is Helen Desmond. This is take two of our interview with Isidore Isaacs, who was a survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. <clears throat> Mr. Isaacs, we were talking about the last days, <clears throat> excuse me, that you spent, well, that you spent in Lager 10. Let's, let's just go back to that yeah. moment. And um, you said that you began to realize that the guards were acting differently, that you, you were getting some hint yeah, that something yeah. was happening. His faces were sour and Did they treat you sad, sad, sad. Was sad, yeah. Did they treat you any differently? No. And then you mentioned that they evacuated the camp. Yeah. Were you all evacuated at the same time? Yeah. And you went to back to Dachau? Yeah, back to Dachau, yeah. By bus? Yeah. Do you remember when this was? This was, uh, yeah. This was April, April. was on 23rd, about 45. And what happened when you returned to Dachau? Yeah, we were prepared for the march. How long did you remain in Dachau? Uh, one day. And what happened then? And then we marched, uh, that was called the Death March. We marched day and night until we got to the mountains. How many people were there, would you say? Maybe 400. Maybe from Dachau also noch, uh, I don't know how many from our camp, uh, about 400. Uh, in Dachau, I don't know if there were some, too. There were Romanian guards uh, with us on the march. And uh, every, every half an hour, there was uh, 20, 30 people on the roadside shot. They couldn't, couldn't make it, they shot them down right away. If they weren't strong enough yeah. to continue? And I had an, uh, pneumonia on the right side. And every step I had got a stitch in, in the lungs. And a pain? Pain, yeah. Terrible. And the shoes, I had no shoes. And, and so we marched in the nineties, nine nights, till we got to the Tyrol, to the mountains. What was the weather like at that time? Was it cold still? And we came to the mountains, there was still snow there. During the march, did you have food? We got some food, very little, some bread sometimes, yeah. And where did you spend the nights? Mostly in outside. In the fields? Yeah. Did um, the prisoners help each other in any way? Everybody was for himself, for survival. Did you know where you were going? Did they tell no. you? No. No. So you reached the mountains, the yeah. Tyrolean this mountains? Yeah. This was May 2nd, 45. And what happened when you reached the mountains? We slept uh, in the snow. Did I, you? I was cuddling near, near other one who had a blanket with him together. And in the morning, the guards were gone. You woke up and the guards were gone? In the morning when we woke up, in the mountains, the guards were gone, the and Germans. This, this was May? May 2nd, 45. And there came the police from the village and took us to the village. How many were left, would you say? Maybe 300. There were from our ghetto two people and and we slept then in the village. This was Wachkirchen. Can you spell W A K I R C H E N. Wachkirchen, near Battels. All right. And this was in Germany. Yeah. Bavaria. Bavaria. In Bavaria. Yeah. And uh, 
Were the people there, did they treat you well? The, the arts people very well, yeah. What kind of people did you say? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The, the arts, uh, the lunch, lunch. Uh, the natives. The, the natives, yeah. Did they give you food and Yeah, clothes? they uh, slaughtered the cow, and I ate from that, and then I got that deadly sick right away from the, from the meat what I ate there. Because you weren't accustomed to oh, eating that. I got diarrhea and it was near dead and it mm. was near finished. But the war was still going on. Germany had not yet surrendered. Is that right? May 2nd was over. There was Patton's army who liberated us. In this village? Yeah. They came through the village. Too. But you were already there. You yeah. were there. Yeah, in they the came village. the panzer, the American panzer. The tanks. tanks. Yeah. Came to the village. So you yeah. were liberated by the Americans. By Patton's son. How, army. Long, how long were you in the village before the army came through? A couple of days. And the people took you into their homes? And yeah, we were in. Uh, in uh, in the home there from the people, yeah. Can you recall the moment that um, the Third Army came through? Can you describe your feelings at that time? Yeah, this was the wave from the trucks, from the tanks, the, the soldiers, and some had a chocolate gift to um, You were happy to was, see them. It was unbelievable. Were there any German soldiers around at that time? No, they were all gone. They were all gone? All gone, disappeared. What were the reactions of the American soldiers when they found you? Do you remember? They went through, they waved on and were you physically ill? You mentioned very, that Very, you... very ill. Very ill. Mm. How much do you think you weighed at that time? Do you have any idea? I know people weighed 85 pounds or such, such fellows. And Tall I... people, yeah. big people. Yeah, <laughs> 85 pounds. Were you very thin? One said to a German, to an American officer, Oh, I lost uh, 40 pounds of you. That's good, he said. In America, it costs a lot of money to lose weight. <laughs> that was his answer. <laughs> he said, I still remember. Oh, this costs a shock of money in, in, in America. <laughs> uh, that was funny to them, huh? <laughs> Um, all right, so you weren't feeling well. You were you were ill, and I and other yeah. people were ill also. Oh, but many many died after the liberation. And then, uh, well, what what did the people do? Who helped you to recover? How did you recover your health? We went to Kloster Sankt Ottilien near, near Munich. Saint Saint Ottilien. Ottilien. The Catholic cloister that they made it for a, for a hospital. Who sent you there, the Americans or the Germans? Uh, we had uh, doctors were, uh, were from liberated doctors to and Dr. Katz also was there, and then there were um, German uh, nurses. And where was this? I had a German nurse. She packed me up. Took oh, care of you? Oh. She where, fed, where fed, was fed me and, and she she took she, good care oh, of you. Oh, that was a wonderful person, yeah. How long were you in this? Nine months. Cloister, nine yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, where was this? Near Munich. Near Munich. Yeah, Sankt Ottilien. Mm -hmm. Were there any special groups or organizations that helped you at that time? Later came uh, in, in Munich was uh, was out of from the Jews there, had an uh, organization too, I forgot the name, for the liberated... Uh, for the so liber there were organizations yeah, there was that helped Yeah, there was an organization there. 
Did the survivors help each other? Not the survivors. I mean, we got closest. This organization provided us with closest. We could go to a store and choose what we what we needed. And mm -hmm. uh, did you at this time reunite with your wife? My wife was then in Poland. She was liberated by the Russians. She didn't know where I am, and I didn't know if she has survived. On one day. I saw two Jewish fellows from the ghetto. They went in a truck and they went to Poland looking for their wives. Where were you at this time? In St. Utilien. In, the in Munich, near yeah, Munich. Munich yeah. Yeah. And I ran to see they were already on the way to, to start. And I wrote down a, a piece of paper, my wife's name, where she was born and everything, and where I am. And, uh, Went away. You asked them to look yeah, for to her. Yeah, to look for her. And they really found her. And she knew then where, where I was, that I am alive. And, and later they prepared with a doctor couple with a ten dollars. Uh, paid the whole fare to Poland, to Czechoslovakia. And um, she has gone to all, all. She was very sick too, and typhus. She was near that too. And um, Did you go to her, or did she come she to come you? She came to me. Oh, with that $10 <laughs> that, she, that was in the I shoe. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> She had to do it. <laughs> she had to do it. Yeah. So she came to she Munich? She came with another doctor couple, uh, doctor we knew from the ghetto. And with the $10, she paid all the fare for her and for the couple, too. For another couple? Yeah. Uh, when was this? When did you reunite? We were reunited, and, and she came. Mm. I don't remember anymore then All right. the exact date. Did you ever um, find any other family members? Any other members of your family? No. One, uh, one uncle, a uh, brother of my father, was with me in Dachau together. And one day they said, uh, elderly people who couldn't walk shall, shall stand up, shall come forward, and they will send them to a lager where they don't have to walk. And he went to that, they call it Lager 7. And so I heard they brought him then to, from there they came to, to Auschwitz, so, so I heard from there. That was one I, uncle? Yeah, one uncle. I never heard of him anymore. Did any other uncles or aunts survive? Nobody. Nobody. No. Did you ever go back to your town, to your hometown? I never will. And you never will? No. All right. When your wife joined you, did yeah. you then go to a DP camp, or what did you do then? Later, when I was well, Made of UNRWA camp, uh, Neu Freimann. Neu Freimann. Neu, Neu, Neu. N -E -U. Mm -hmm. Freimann. F R E I M O M E N. And was this a, this was an UNRWA camp? Yeah, they had uh, an officer, American officer, and they had clothes, and we got food there and everything. And we lived there in... Uh, Where was this? This was, uh, <coughs> this was near Landsberg was the name of the city. Have you ever heard of it? Yes. <coughs> near Landsberg. How long were you in this camp? And then we were there in the Neufreimann till we, till, we till we got the visa for the United States. Okay, so how long would you say that was? I think... Uh, from liberation from 
från Rona till december. You so you were in the in uh, this yeah, life, camp in the Yonra camp for yeah. about six months. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you a question. Um, was the entrance at the camp checked by anyone? Yeah, yeah there was a guard. Yeah. What? Who was it? I mean, what kind of a guard was it? Was it a soldier or a private guard? No, only I remember it was a guard. Who wasn't a guard, I don't remember. How did you manage to support yourself in the camp? You got everything. The UNRWA gave yeah. you everything. And I worked and later in the immigration department. There was a woman, a Jewish woman, Rose. She wrote her an aufbau that I'm alive, that they knew the people in in the, my wife's uh, sister in, in New York, that time a lifetime at here. Oh, she contacted yeah. your relatives yeah, in She New was York? the head of the immigration department, and I helped her making out um, the forms for, for, for the immigrants to America. Did you speak to any German people after the liberation? Only. Uh, when we were in Bremen for the departure, and there was a strike in America, and we couldn't, we couldn't get the boat. It was a long strike, and my wife was pregnant then, and the food was very, very poor. And there were German people who brought herring or something, and we sent later, we sent them packages. There were one couple, one couple in Bremen. Uh, so they helped you? Yeah, they helped, yeah, mm -hmm. with food. And uh, when did you leave the uh, the DP camp for Bremen? You, uh, you, you got on your... On the boat, on the boat, yeah. December 10th. December 10th? 46. And the Marine Marlin, this was the USS uh, top, uh, troop transport at Liberty. A Liberty ship? Mm -hmm. I slept uh, and then where the, uh, where the motors are in the, in the hangar motor. And when we came over the channel, oh gosh. You were seasick? Oh, I was sick. And How she long? was pregnant. And oh, it was a hard crossing. Oh. How long did the crossing take? Ten days. Ten days. Yeah. And it was not easy. Oh, and she was vomiting and the doctor was very good. and. So you left Europe December 10th, 1946, yeah. and where did you go? New York. Mm -hmm. Picked us up on the boat. Who picked you up? Um, her brother, my wife's brother, and her, and her cousin. Did any organization uh, or people other than UNRWA help you to come over? No. Only in New York there was an organization who sent her to the hospital right away, and she came the other day right away in the hospital. Because of her condition? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how was she? Was she all right? Yeah. How long did she stay in the hospital? Mm, a couple of weeks, I think. I oh, think yes. yes. And where did you stay in the meantime? I lived in my and her sister's in her sister's house. What were your feelings when you arrived in this? What? How did you feel when you arrived in this country? No, I was elated to say we were here in the States. Did you get any special help in adjusting to your new life? either from organizations or private citizens? There was, I uh, forgot the organization, Blue, a Jewish organization who helped in the beginning. Did I they give you much help? We didn't need much. After three weeks I found a job and, and I, I got... What did you do? When I, you came? I worked for uh, an importer. For an company. importer? Yeah, import-export. They had a good boss, a uh, Holland, 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 uh, Jew from Holland. A Jew from Holland, yeah. also a survivor, or? Yeah, he came 41 over England, over England he came from Holland. Mm -hmm. But he was f 
for me. He did everything. He was kind. Oh. And you remained in New York? I worked there for 27 years in this company. Did you stay in New York the whole time? Yeah, yeah. So for 27 years you lived in New York? Yeah, and I worked all the time till we went to Israel. Uh, let me ask you, you said your wife was pregnant? Yeah. And she had, you have another child? Yeah, this is, that's uh, it. Well, we'll see the pictures afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, you can't see them now. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have a son, I believe you said? Yeah, yeah. And He's 47 now. And he lives in New York? Yeah. When you first came to this country, did you speak of the Holocaust to anybody? <clears throat> I tried to speak to a vice president, a Jewish woman in our company. I told her my mother was killed and I lost my son. She said to me, was it really so bad? Mm. Maybe it was, the, was for the best. And since then, I don't, uh, didn't talk to anybody anymore. So I'm an arrogant, I'm a stupid idiot from woman. That must have been a terrible yeah, thing for yeah, you to hear. Yeah, yeah. When I left the company, when I retired, I gave her, I gave her hell. You told her yeah, then? She said, I'm a, a maniac, and she ran in the office. <laughs> she didn't understand no, even then. so stupid, so I... Uh, it's unbelievable. The Jewish woman also say, maybe it was for the best. Very difficult yeah. to understand. <laughs> How long did you, you mentioned you uh, went to Israel to live. You lived here for 27 years, and then you decided to leave? Yeah, well, I had all the family in, in, in Israel, and my sister said uh, I should come, on, and so I went. And what year was that? 73. And, and the young Kippur war, when I told you, the started the, the first night when we were. And the uh, first night you arrived in Israel, yeah, the Yom Kippur yeah, war started. Yeah, yeah. And how long? It was a good, uh, good timing. <laughs> Very poor timing. <laughs> Did you feel as if you had been through this once before? Yeah. Yeah. How long did you remain in Israel? Fifteen years. And what happened then? You moved back to the United States? Came with Intifada, with the Arabs, and, the, and we have the son here, and uh, we couldn't adjust uh, with the language. And we lived for very, very nicely on the Carmel, and we had the sisters and brothers, and, but still, your son did not go back no, to Israel with you? No, he didn't want to come. He didn't want to come. So he remained here, yeah. and you came back yeah. to join him. Yeah. You must have had quite a family reunion in Israel with your sisters and brothers. Yeah. yeah. Did your wife have family there also? She has only cause she had a brother that died, and then she has cousins living in Kibbutzim. And so you came back to the United States. Yeah. And what year was that? This was in, in five years ago. This was in 80, 86, end of 86. And where did you come at that time? We went right away here in... Miami. Yeah, er, in, in the Pembroke Pines. Pembroke Pines. It was a year before I, I bought already the condo, and then we went back, and then we packed, and... In later years, when you came back here, did you ever speak of your experiences again with anybody else? Hardly. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever discuss the Holocaust with your son and his children? He does know very little. Only knows that he had a bar and Did he ever want to discuss it with you? He doesn't touch it, and we don't touch it very much. And All right. If you were to tell us something about the Holocaust that could live on beyond us, what would it be? How did the Holocaust affect you, and what do you think of it?
I mean, uh, I'm not the same person as I was before. It uh, affects me very badly. Um, especially the loss of, I can't come over till today, the loss of our child. My mother, she had such a wonderful woman. Is there yes, any? My sister was uh, a problem. She, my sister from Israel sent a, a, a youth certificate. A youth Yes, she was already 41 and she went to Hashara and she and we packed and prepared for her already. And suddenly, this was a list of telegram for 17 youth, uh, young people special over Sweden with the aeroplane to go. You were in the ghetto at the time? Yeah. And, and now this was still in, 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 in Taurog, I think. Yeah. And suddenly from the Jewish community in Kovno, they said they give her a certificate for another girl. She was on the list. This man had two girls, two daughters. One wa was already older. She wasn't supposed to get a youth certificate. Well, probably he gave money and he had connection and they gave the, my sister a certificate for the two Kaplans, for the two girls. They went instead and my sister was killed. That's what they did. In the, in the Jewish, in the Jewish agency in Kovno, and then the, they took away her. Yeah, her, her certificate, certificate and gave the two for that for that man, and she was she was killed. Do you have yeah. a message that you would give us about the Holocaust for future generations? I'm very pessimistic for the future. I'm telling you. Before we close, Mr. Isaacs, yeah. is there anything that you should like to mention about your experiences that I have not asked you about? Later, you find out later when this is all over. I'm sure. You can't, uh, so many things you can't always. Can't uh, we remember. have some photographs and yeah. I know we're going to show them. So um, I want to thank you for sharing your experience with us. And uh, this perhaps, is my parents. All right, now if you'll just hold them up. Yeah. C can you tell us their name? In this son, Isaacs and Ida. Okay, thank you. And show us um, this, this is one, our, this our one child. Next. Show us this. Does, that's where we lived in Love. Europe, okay. in Germany. As my father built a house. <clears throat> Do you know if that house is still there? Hmm? Is that house still in existence? So, yeah, my one cousin came with the, with the Russian army and he went to the village and he said that our house is still standing, but his father's house is gone, but ours, ours is still there. All right. And this is my wife and my murdered son. And his name is Ralph? Ralph. How old was Ralph there? Yes, he was six years old. And Where was that photograph taken? In Saugen. Yeah. There he was born. And this, my, my sister, his mother too. What is her name? Hildegard. That was your youngest sister? This was the who I was supposed to go and use earlier. Her papers were taken yeah. away from her? Yeah. Okay. To a swindle. And that's a cousin. Uh, what are the. Norbert. Norbert Isaacs and his wife. What is his wife's name? Um, oh, 
Junge weiblich. Das ist ihm da. Er saß da ein Baby und sie killt da mit dem Baby zu Gaza. Okay. Ja. And what other photographs do you have? Das ist. Oh, let's see. Das ist wir don't need that. Yeah? Yes, put that in. That's my wife and I. Do you know when approximately that picture was taken? Were you married at that time? Yeah, yeah, sure. Was that before the war? I think that's after the war. Okay. And this, this is again the boy, the little baby. Let's show it. Here. This again, our oh, little baby. All right. He was much younger there. Yeah, he was born then. This is my son? Yes. This is my son, Norman. Norman. Now, where does Norman live? In New York. Okay. This is my family in Israel. The brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. And you and your wife are in the center of that photograph, right? All right, and I think you have yeah, one, yeah, center, yeah. one other photograph you'd like to show us. O only this now? Yes. It's a fa family to my brothers and sisters in Israel. And they were living in Israel during the war? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Isaacs. It's also my mother. This has been Helen Desmond interviewing Isidore Isaacs about his experiences as a survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. This interview will be included as a valuable contribution to the oral history library of the Holocaust Documentation and Education Center, Incorporated.